السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا We have uh, great pleasure and an honor tonight to have one of our distinguished Muslim scholar who has contributed a lot in Islamic da'wah. In fact, he has introduced a new method he is a champion of one of the fantastic method of uh, preaching Islam. Such method, really, it has been ignored for many, many years. Although it was there, and it is there in the Holy Quran, that method is comparative religions. Really, we, we, are, we are so much appreciate what he is doing. And it has really contributed a lot in our Islamic da'wah. And our youngsters, our field workers, our scholars should learn as they have learned from our distinguished Muslim scholar, our brother, Sheikh, our Mze, our father, Sheikh Ahmad Didat. On behalf of myself and on behalf of our Majlis, the committee of this uh, Jamia Mos, we welcome our distinguished uh, Muslim scholar and his, uh, and his colleague to our mosque and to give uh, uh, what he has in his mind, the light he has brought to us, and uh, for sure we will benefit from his long experience in this field of Dawa. Sheikh Ahmad Didat, you are so much welcome. Welcome, Jazakallah. <laughs> تعالى في شان حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله صل على سيدنا وعلى سيدنا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا إن جتمأت الإنس والجن على أن يأتوا بمثل هذا القرآن لا يعطون بمثله ولو كان بعضهم لبعض زهيرا صدق الله صدق الله العظيم My dear brethren I recited to you one verse from the Holy Quran from Surah Bani Israel I was suggesting to my brethren present last night at the Masjid al-Nur that if anybody gives you any reference from the Holy Quran Make a point of going home and checking up. Not that you are doubting the speaker. That the speaker has any reason to bluff you. No. If you go and check up these ayahs, 
that ayah, when you see it with your eyes, you read it with your heart and mind, they will become a part of your own property. And then you in turn will be able to share with others. That is the purpose of you going home and checking up. In your Swahili translation, or in your English translation, or any other translation that you are familiar with. I read this ayah from Surah Bani Israel. And Bani Israel is one of the chapters of the Quran out of 114 chapters. There are 114 surahs in the Holy Quran. Out of the 114, Bani Israel is only one of them. And how will you find Bani Israel? I know my young man has got the answer. How will you find Bani Israel? If you have a translation like this particular one here, I have in my hand, by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. It's a monumental work. This translation at the back of it has got a very comprehensive index. Just like a dictionary at the back. Anything you want to know, you look up in the index. I said Bani Israel, so under B, like a dictionary, look for Bani Israel. It will tell you chapter 17. And 17 will be easy to find because every page is numbered. So everything becomes handy for you. You want to know about marriage in Islam? And the M. You want to know about divorce? And the D. You want to know about heaven or hell or hereafter? And the H. You want to know about Jesus? And the J. Everything on your fingertips. You owe it to yourself if it's possible to obtain this translation. Bani Israel chapter 17. So we open 17. Now, now I'm telling you it's ayah number 88. Ayah number 88. 88 is easy to find because every verse is numbered. You found the chapter, you found the ayah. Read it. This is pull. Allah Ta'ala is commanding our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say, tell them. Pull, say. لَإِنِ اتَّمَأَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ أَلَا عَنْ يَعْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ That if the whole of mankind and the jinns, if they were to gather together to produce the like of this Qur'an, Allah says, لَا يَعْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ They will never be able to produce the like thereof. وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْدُهُمْ لِبَعْدٍ زَهِيرًا Even if they backed up each other with help and support. You can never produce the like of this Qur'an. And this challenge has stood for 1400 years. The world is challenged to produce the like of this book and it has not been able to produce one. But that does not mean that the enemy has given up hope. The first instance, the Western, Western Christians, they say, look, we don't know Arabic. You're telling us to produce the like of this book, this is in Arabic and we don't know Arabic. Valid excuse. But they're forgetting that there are 15 million Arab Christians. Every Arab is not a Muslim. Don't make a mistake. I met a man for breakfast this morning or this lunchtime. A brother introduced me. This is some Hamza. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. Shook hands. This is from Egypt. Shook hands with him. And he's gone. After he's gone, he says he is a Christian Egyptian. Hamza. Hamza sounds so like Muslim. Tariq Aziz, the foreign minister of, of Iraq. Tariq Aziz to us was a Muslim. Tariq Aziz sounds like a Muslim name. We took him for a Muslim. But when you find out, he says, no, he's not a Muslim. He is a Marxist Christian. Not only ordinary Christian, he's a Marxist Christian. Enemy of an enemy. And he is the head, he is the foreign minister of Iraq. So we get caught with names. You know, Suleiman Farangi, at one time, the president of Lebanon. I thought he was a Muslim. Yusuf Lule. Yusuf Lule. When Idi Amin went, the man who took his place was Yusuf Lule. And I said, Yusuf Lule? Oh, no, I, Amin went, another Muslim took his place. That's what I understood. Yusuf means Muslim. To every one of us, Yusuf is Muslim. Uh, Dawood is Muslim. Suleiman is Muslim. No, 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 no. So when I came to Kenya around that time, I buy one of your newspapers and I read there the life of Yusuf Lule. Yusuf Lule is a Christian. His wife is a Christian. But his father was a Muslim. He 
His mother was a Muslim. His grandfather was a Muslim. His grandmother was a Muslim. They were Muslim through and through for generations. But Yusuf Lule is a Christian. How did that happen? How did that happen? His father was trying to steal education. You see, the Christian made it a policy, no Christianity, no education. Unless you become a Christian, no education for you. Keep you people backwards. Pull the rickshaws. You have no rickshaws here. We have in South Africa. Rickshaw. You know rickshaw pulling rickshaw? Like a human horse, like a donkey. You want to do the donkey job. You Muslims, everybody must do a donkey job. The Christian get education so he can rule you. So his father sent him to school. He's a Muslim. So he says, no, let's change his name to Joseph. Joseph Lule. So he passes Joseph Lule at the Eddie Education. He's very brilliant. He passes exams. So he sent him to Fort Hay in South Africa. Another mission school. From there, he qualified, went to a British mission school in England. Now, he's day and night he's being programmed, brainwashed, and he returns home, he's arguing with his father, the poor father, what does he know? So his father, Christ died for our sins. The father is arguing and debating, poor father. You know, he depends upon use of rulers. Salary. So, huh, converted. So the Christians are not easy to give up. 15 million Arab Christians. 15 million. And they are brains. They are intellectuals. They steal our brains. I can give you examples after examples. How they make monkeys out of us. So these Christians, Arabs, this is no man. This challenge is standing for too long. We are going to produce something to challenge the Quran. And they produced it. They produced a book. This is the new Injil. The latest Injil. In the most Fasih and Balik language. Right. So now, this is, this is now to challenge your Quran. You say the Quran can't be reproduced? So we reproduce it. And they are singing this, chanting this from Monte Carlo Radio. If you happen to tune in, in the middle of the night, and you hear somebody reading like Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, you know the voice from heaven, from Egypt. He died now. But his voice is still alive. Abdul Samad Abdul Basit. Taqari Abdul Samad Abdul Basit. They are able to reproduce the sound like Abdul Samad Abdul Basit. You tune in, you say, Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, I thought he's dead. But man, he's here. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. No. Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, you read Bismillah two minutes. You know, Bismillah. Two minutes without breaking his breath. So these guys can also do the same. The Christians, artists, Christian Arabs, they can also reproduce. Maybe not like Basit, but something near enough for us to be bluffed. So they read, and I want Sheikh Siraz, in the beautiful manner in which he recited Allah's Kalam, the Quran, I want him to do justice to this. Don't be unjust to the Christians. I want you to try to read the way you read the Quran. Like Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, the usual way. If you see Bismillah, you read Bismillah the way you read the Quranic Bismillah. And Sakulya the way you read the Quran. I want you to read this and let the people hear this new Injil, a challenge to the Quran. Please come forward. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله حقا فآمنوا بي ولا تخافوا إن لكم عند الله جنات إن لكم عند الله جنات نزلا فلا أسبقنكم إلى الله لأعدها لكم ثم لا أتينكم نزلة أخرى. Now I want you to give to vote. Now. Does it sound like the Quran? Look, the man started. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Any objection? Anybody? Anybody? Can you take objection to that? 
This is Allah's kalam. They stole the verse from the Quran and they put it into the Bible. And every chapter starts with Bismillah, 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 Bismillah. There is no Bismillah in the encyclopedia called the Bible. No Bismillah. But in this new Injil now, every chapter begins with Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. So when you hear this passage is reading, nah. so Qul, 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 Ya Yuhallazina Amanu. Any objection? No. These are also picked up from the Quran, stolen from the Quran, verses, phrases, <laughs> put together to catch fish. See, the Christians know how to catch fish. Then the fishermen ought to know. You people here on the seaside here. No, this is Nairobi. You know, Mombasa, you do fishing. Here, you don't do fishing. The fisherman knows that there are type and type of fish, needs different type of bait. So to catch the fish, the one you want, you got to put the right bait for that fish. Every fish doesn't bite the same bait. Do you know that? Some fish, they bite bread. Other fish don't. They don't even smell it. They want worm. So you gotta, if you want to catch that fish, you need a worm. You know that? You can't catch it. There's another one. It's bread. You can catch it with bread. <laughs> so the Christian knows now that this fish, Muslim, Muslim, he's going to bite this. It's like into your taste. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ This is all. This is right. It's stolen, stolen, stolen from the Quran. There's nothing like this in the Christian Bible, but this is the new Injil. Now, generally, all of us, most of us, non-Arabs, we can't catch the joke. We can't catch the joke. But the Arab, I made one Arab to read it. You know, Saudi. He was an A pilot. He came in, he just happened to come in. I was in Riyadh. And I said, like, come, come, I want you to read this. So he started reading. And he started laughing. And he started rolling on the ground. <laughs> he started rolling like a madman. <laughs> this is silly. But you and I, I'm a Hindi, I'm an Indian. Arabic is not my mother tongue, I don't know Arabic as a language. So I get caught, you get caught, trying to catch fish, making you to accept this as a new revelation, new wahi. But the Christians, they find, they say, look, everybody won't bite this. Is that Arabic speaking fellow, he's gonna catch that. We says we don't know, we're dumbfounded, we don't know, sounds like the Quran, we don't know. Hmm? So, they're going to catch you. They send you this book. In South Africa, we're getting it. Maybe you people are too poor here. See, they said these are too poor people, you know. You're not on it. I don't know, anybody receive this here? No greater love. No, you people are too poor. You haven't got money. My people are in South Africa, they're moneyed people. So we get this in the post from America. By post. It must cost them a hundred shillings, postage. And we get it, it says, no greater love. Wouldn't you like to read it? Love and romance. Even old people like to read it, I'm telling you. Huh? You think I'm finished now? I'm 75 now. When I was 16, I was interested. You think I'm, I lost my interest? No, no, I stayed. No, no, no. <laughs> Somebody give you free of charge. Yasha, no greater love. You take it home, so let me see. You open the book, what it is? The Holy Bible. Bible. Bible! This is a Bible! Caught you fish. This is made you take it home. <laughs> you want to be love and romance? Caught you fish. They caught you fish. Mm -hmm. ah, clever, clever. Geniuses, geniuses. Hmm. Ah, you go to Hong Kong. You go to your hotel. Oh, you're yeah, in this hotel, Hotel of Man Hilton. There's a New Testament there in three languages. Three languages, English, and there are two other languages. I think maybe French and some German. Three languages, multi-language. In every room, every room, free. They got the fish, catching fish in the hotels. This one, you go to Hong Kong, you get this. Good news for visitors. You like to read. You know, you as a visitor, as a tourist, you like to go around. What places you can see? Massage parlors, dancers, you know. You want to know, man, what they have to offer you in Hong Kong. No. Yes. In the hotel. You open the book. What do you find? <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> Caught you fish again. Caught you fish again. Uh-huh. 
the book of life. In South Africa, everybody carries an identity. The name of that identity is the book of life. Your life. That means all your history. When you were born, what not, what license you got, firearm license, motor car license, everything. When you got married, you carry that with you. I got one with me in my pocket. I carry this. It's inside here. My license and everything is in there. By law now, we have to carry that. So I, I still got it with me. See? It's well protected, but I carry it with me. It's called the book of life. So now they give you a book of life. Yes, you want to know about the book of life. So you open it, what? What, what? The Bible! They caught you again. They caught you again. <laughs> you know, they're indefatigable. They don't get tired. The Christians don't get tired. Hmm. Look at this. Desert storm. <laughs> Desert storm. Don't you like to know about desert storm? You know Saddam? Saddam. That guy Saddam, how he invaded Kuwait. Hmm? And how America came in. And how, you know, he got him out of Kuwait. How did they manage to get half a million people in the desert without losing one soldier by gunfire? Not one soldier, they lost half a million soldiers they got into the desert without losing one. And how the scud missiles of Saddam, how they counteracted with the Patriot missiles. Don't you like to read it? Wouldn't you like to know? Free of charge. Bakshish. Bakshish. Huh? <laughs> you open, go home and open. Ah. With the blessing of the American Army, Navy and Air Force. Army, Navy and Air Force. The uniform of the American soldier. 100% military book about the war. That's what you think. Huh? That's what you think. Yes. Do you open it? <laughs> the Good News Bible. <laughs> Look, this is how hard they are trying. They are trying. Look, they are trying. We got to give them credit. We got to take our hat to them. So the guys are great. The guys at home, in their own motherland, the Americans. They got 25 million sodomites. Or milut. You know whom you call gays. You know gays? You know it's gay? Yeah. Men with men. Hmm? They call them gays. There are 25 million. The whole total population of Kenya, men, women and children, that number of people, all gay, sodomite, Kaumelut. That rubbish nation is sending those missionaries. There are 35,000 involved in Africa at the moment wanting to convert you. 35,000 occupied in Africa today. In Indonesia, some 10 years ago, there were 6,000 raising the dust. In Bangladesh, in Pakistan, all over the world, shh, they are working, they are working, wanting to convert you. At home, they are rotten to the core. They have problems after problems. Last night I was seeing on TV, there are 7 million gambling problems, gamblers, young men. Gambling problem. It's, a, it's, a addict. it's an addiction. And the only religion that on the face of the earth says don't gamble is Islam. The only religion on the face of the earth says don't drink alcohol is Islam. Do you know that? No other religion says that don't drink, don't gamble, don't be fortune telling, don't be promiscuous. Islam says that. They have a problem. I didn't know that they have now, they have a drinking problem. 11 million drunkards in America and 44 million heavy drinkers. And Jimmy Swaggart in his book, he said, I make no difference between the heavy drinkers and the drunkards. There have been 55 million drunkards in America. 50, according to Jimmy Swagger, 55 million drunkards. And that nation is worried about you. They want to save you from hellfire. They are in hell themselves, but they want to save you. <laughs> they are working hard. The thing is, we have to admire them. They work very hard. <laughs> Last night I was in Masjid al Nur. I had this with me, but I didn't have the presence of mind. Look, this looks like Masjid al Nur. This looks like Masjid al Nur. It says Nur al Haq. Sounds Muslim. Yes, Nur al Haq. It says here, why is the cow mentioned in the Quran? Question mark. Don't you like to know? What does this, its symbolism? Question mark. Don't you want to know? The sign of Qurbani. The sign of Qurbani. Don't you want to know? Of course you want to know. Open the first page. Open the first page and you read. First, start with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Caught you. 
Who is that? What? Huh? Ma'amun Abdullah. Ma'amun Abdullah. Sounds Muslim? Ma'amun Abdullah is the, the, the writer. And starts with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. First, starts with the Quranic ayah. O ye who believe, do your duty to Allah, seek the means of approach unto Him. Al Quran, Surah Al Maidah, Chapter 5, Verse 35. Swallow. Take it. Next ayah from Surah Al Buruj. Truly strong is the grip and power of the Lord, of thy Lord. It is He who creates from the very beginning and He can restore life. Surah Al Buruj, chapter 85, verses 12 and 13. Swallow. Next one from Surah ba Baqarah. Next one from Surah Al Imran. Shh. Catching fish. Catching fish. Who is the author? Mamun Abdullah. Starts with Bismillah Rahman Rahim. And that's catching you. Catching you. Catching you. Yeah, we are biting. This fish will bite. Allah's kalam. Allah's kalam. Allah's kalam. And then carries on. And then he, they introduce. Slyly. A Taurat. A Taurat. You heard the Taurat? So we Muslims, we live in Zabur. Taurat, Taurat, Zabur, Injil. And Furqan, the Quran. We say we believe in the four heavenly books. At Taurat. Then in brackets, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 1 to 8. Let's <laughs> keep Taurat. Got you? <laughs> and then they're catching fish. Look, they work, they work, they work. One side English, one side Arabic. My Saudi brothers, they think they are safe. Saudi Arabia think they're safe. And there's one thing, I must congr congratulate King Fahad. One thing, I don't know whether you agree with him or not. We are not worried about his politics. But Saudi Arabia is the only Muslim country in the world where there is no church. That's all. For that, I take up my hat to him. They're the only Muslim country in the world where there is no church. Ah, the Christians, they slightly, they do the job. They're working. But officially, not one church in that whole country. But the Christians, they want to get to. Here's a book called Sound the Alarm from Saudi Arabia. Sound the Alarm. Sound the Alarm from Saudi Arabia. Start it from there, man. The heartland of Islam. Start your missionary work there. Sound the Alarm from Saudi Arabia, <laughs> written by Tom Griffith. And these Arabs, they, they called him uh, Abu Philip. Abu Philip means father of Philip. <laughs> That's how the Saudis called him, Abu Philip. And he worked for them in Jidda, and Riyadh, and in Taif. He was studying them, this fish, the Saudi fish. They were, he was studying the Saudi fish, as to how to catch him. Then he wrote a book that if you can't go and knock at his door, you can get into the post. You can get in through the post. Shh, beautiful, beautiful. And not only to get in through the post, but how to get his daughters, the Saudi girls, and the Kuwaiti girls, and the Bahraini girls. They're not interested in your daughters and my daughters. Mm -hmm. They were interested in the Arab, Arab girl. See, how beautiful. This is from a Christian magazine. This is from a Christian magazine. For Christians, not for you, not for me. But somehow, because I'm in the field, these things come to me. Here is a beautiful lady. Even with the hijab, she looks beautiful. Wallah. Even with the hijab, she looks beautiful. You can only see her eyes. You can see nothing more. Everything else is black. You only see her eyes, but she's beautiful. Even the eyes that you see are beautiful. Wallah. Hmm? So they say, she may never meet a Christian. Poor thing. She may never meet a Christian. This is so eager. This Kuwaiti girl, this Bahraini girl, she may never meet a Christian. But you could write to her about God's love. How can the Christian in England write to a Saudi girl about God's love? Is it possible? Did these Saudi girls give them their addresses? No. Then how can they write to her? No, no, they have a way, they have a knack. There are Arab magazines. See? 
And in that magazine, run by Christians, editors and all, they advertise for pen pals. You want pen pals, friend people that you can write to? He says, yes. Your girls for girls? He says, yes. So he said, write to this address to the newspaper, the magazine, and the magazine will give it to the Christian missionaries, and they will communicate with your daughter, with your sister, and create a contact that look, when you come to London, be my guest, I'll take you to Hyde Park, I'll take you to Buckingham Palace. Shh, shh, shh. Man, they're fishing, they're fishing, they're fishing, and they do catch fish. You never go fishing if you don't catch anything at all, you know that? Now and then when you wait for hours, hours, but you catch something, next time you are encouraged to go. If you don't catch at all, you'll never go fishing. Sometimes there's something you do catch. <laughs> they're working, they're working, working. But now on your level, on our level. If I gave you these, free, bakshish, ah, let me charge you 10 shillings each. Will you buy this beautiful tokharas for putting in your house, on the wall? This masjid also needs a little bit of, uh, you know, hmm? brightening up, brightening up, right? Wouldn't you like to have this? 10 shillings each, is it too much? 10 shillings each, it's too much? Huh? Look at this, look at this. Beautiful man. Won't you agree? Arabic calligraphy, Quranic calligraphy. This is how we write the Quran. Hmm? Uh, what does it say? Abana. Abana. You think it says Rabbana Atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa kin azabna. No, no, no. This is in Arabic, O oh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hmm? Arabs are getting caught with this, Arabs. What about Swahilis? You, me, Hindis, huh? Bangladeshis, <laughs> catching fish. Beautiful, beautiful. Catching fish. Somebody gave you, ah, you take it home, tell your child to put it on the wall. <laughs> Here are beautiful publications, free distribution. Why I became a Muslim? Why I became a Muslim? By Sultan Muhammad Paul. Sultan Muhammad Paul. He was Sultan Muhammad, a Pakistani. He's become a Christian. So now he becomes Sultan Muhammad Paul. Now, when you, why he became a Christian? And you open the book inside, <laughs> you find ayahs from the Quran. Verses is trying to tell you justification why he became a Christian, quoting you the Quran. What are you going to do with this? Somebody gave you this, you took it home. Why? I want to see what this guy says. And you read inside and see Quranic ayahs. What do you do? You tear it, you burn it, put it in the dustbin. No, you kiss it and put it next to the Quran. A snake in the house. A snake, you are going to look after this snake. Because Allah's kalam is there. The guy knows that this fish is going to bite that. You're going to catch, get caught. So the Quranic ayahs. You kiss it. Now what are you going to do? You got caught. Hmm? What are you going to do with this? Tear it? Throw it in the dustbin? Burn it? No. <laughs> you put it next to the Quran. A snake in the house. Another one. From Sufism to Christ. John Abdul Subhan. Abdul Subhan. Subhanallah. He became a Christian. He's become John. <laughs> Same, same. Open ah, his picture here. He's a Pakistani. He's a bishop. He's a bishop. He's a bishop. Muslim. Father and mother Muslim. Grandfather, grandmother Muslim. And now he's become a Christian. And he's now is John Abdul Subhan. Bishop. Subhanallah. And ayah from the Quran. They know how to catch us. This Muslim fish will bite this bait. Put it next to the Quran. Uh -huh. Christian witness among Muslims. Here is a Ghanaian or a Nigerian huh? near Africa. His man is sitting there on the ground with a subhi, tasbih, you know, subhanallah, 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 subhanallah. You, know, you, you have that? Yes. Look. Attractive to any African. Christian witness among Muslims. And on the cover is written, Inna Allah yubashiruki bi kalimatim minhu ismuhul masih hu isabnu maryama. 
ayah from the Quran. What are you going to do? Put it next to the Quran. Another snake in the house. They know how to catch fish. Mm. These are now, this is another Indian, Hindi, who has become a Christian and is written a book in search of assurance in Arabic and in English. Multicolored job, four color job. All these beautiful books. All these beautiful books in Arabic. So the Arab is not deprived. This one for our, our people, our Muslim neighbors. Your masjid, Regent's Park Mosque, on the cover. Look, you didn't produce work like this, they produce it. This is, ah, Muslim. Our Muslim neighbors, let's read what they have to say. Got you. Yeah. Beautiful publication. Title. Kaifa Nusalli. How do you pray? We just prayed just now. But the question they are asking, how do you pray? So you read inside, they're making a mockery of our salat. So you people, you fools, you put your head down and put your bump up. Huh? Is that the way to pray? <laughs> they're giggling. It's fun for them. Huh? You're putting your head down, putting your bump up. Is that how you pray? They are making a mockery of our salat. Making monkeys out of us. But now we can turn the tables. Look, Allah has given us that. He's given us that blessing. At every step you can turn the tables. Turn it on Him. He's laughing at you, the laugh is on Him. And we use this, Wallah, we use this. In South Africa, in Durban, our city of Durban, we have the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere. That's what we claim, we boast. Our masjid is the largest south of the equator. Because there are hardly any Muslim countries south of the equator. Most of them are in the northern hemisphere. So you have the big, big masjids in the north, but south of the equator, we are boasting and nobody has challenged us. Maybe it's not, but we say it's the largest. And it attracts a lot of visitors. More than 12,000 a year, tourists, visitors come. They come because of the beautiful architecture. They come because they want to see something nice and funny. Really. Because they don't know the difference between a mosque and a temple. They think it's a different name for the same thing. See, the Muslim house of prayer is called a mosque, a masjid. The Hindu house of prayer, a temple. A Jewish house of prayer, a synagogue. A Christian house of prayer, a church. These are the different titles you give to the different houses of prayer. But to the Westerner, they, he thinks temple and mosque is one and the same thing. It's only you call it by different names. So they want to come. They want to visit the mosque. They want to see our... Nice, nice, funny, funny things here. You know, our monkey gods, our elephant gods, our snake gods, all lined up. Monkey god for Monday, elephant god for Tuesday, snake god for Wednesday. Well, this is what they're thinking. That, that fish is thinking. Now you want to catch that fish? Look, they are trying to catch you fish. They are coming along, they are sniffing for your monkey gods, your elephant gods, your snake gods, all your gods lined up. That's what they are thinking. They think there is no difference between a mosque and a temple. And in my country, mostly in Durban, most of the people that are going there are Hindus, Indians. So this is right. The majority of the Indians in India are Hindus. The majority of the Indians in South Africa are also Hindus. So they think every Indian is a Hindu. So they come to the mosque. And they come inside and they look exactly like your masjid here. Nothing fancy. Plain, simple, beautiful, but plain, simple. They want to know, where are your gods? Where are your gods? No, they want to see your gods. So he says, we have no idols and images here. So some of them say, do you only take them out on Fridays? On Fridays, we hear that, you know, Friday is a big day for you guys. Maybe you take out your gods, your monkey god and elephant god and snake god for airing. Give them fresh air on Fridays. We say, no, not even on Fridays. We hate these things. We abhor them. We are Muslims. And still they can't understand. You look like an Indian. So yeah, I can't say no. I don't look like an Indian. I come from India. I look like an Indian. So to them now, every Indian is a Hindu. They don't know there are three types of Indians in South Africa, religiously. The Indian Hindu, Indian Christian, Indian Muslim. All Indians. All look alike. But there's an Indian Hindu there, like you have here. See, there's another Indian there, he's a Hindu. There's another Indian who's a Christian. There's another Indian who's a Muslim. You are with your brother Indian Muslims here. 
See, but the other guy doesn't know. He thinks every Indian is a Hindu. So they come along looking for our gods. What an opportunity. Wallah, what an opportunity. Of disabusing their minds, of reprogramming them. They're already programmed, brainwashed. How to reprogram them? So first thing we do, we invite these people. We want them to come. We can disabuse their minds. We can program them. They are inquisitive. So, first thing, as soon as they come, please take off your shoes. Please take off your shoes. Yeah. It's inconvenience. No doubt. Taking off shoes, that's one of the hardest parts. You know that? We Muslims will be more particular with our salat five times a day if there was no wudu and no taking off shoes. You know that? If there was no wudu, you know wudu ab ablution. You don't have to do that. You don't have to take off shoes. Just stand you know, 90% of our people will be ready for salah. You know that? Because now we have to take off our shoes. We've got to make wudu. <laughs> That's all putting people, laziness, putting people off, you know. This is, look, I'll do it one time. Hmm? Isha. Badal Isha, do it all wholesale. So, inconvenience. You're putting the band to inconvenience, taking off the shoes. It's not easy. The guy's not used to in the middle of the day taking off the shoes. He's taking off the shoes. <laughs> So we start a conversation. So do you know why you're taking off your shoes? The guy says, no. Do you like to know? Nobody ever says he doesn't want to know. It's the nature of man, he wants to know why. You know that we all want to know why, why, why. Do you know why? why? See, yes. He says, you remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai? God spoke to him and he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where understand is holy ground. In respect of that commandment, we take off our shoes. But God commanded Moses, in your book, in your Bible. When the Zulus come along, we tell them in Zulu, from the Zulu Bible. It says, what mm, No arguments, no arguments. This is what's written in their own book. What God commanded their own prophets to do. We are doing it. If it's an Afrikaner, we quote him from the Afrikaans Bible. The Dutchman who's ruling us. Says, and he said, Muni nader komni. Trek your schooner, fan your footer af. When the plek where you upstand is heli khakhrant. No arguments. Wallah, no arguments. <laughs> the guy says, man, these guys are better than us. <laughs> Look, it's written in my Bible. And these Muslims are following it. Any arguments? No arguments. He will not try to score points. He says, you know, before we go in for prayer, we make ablution, wudu. Show them, show them. Wudu. We wash ourselves. The hands, the feet, the nostrils, the nape of the neck, gargling them out, brushing the teeth. This the Muslim does five times a day, every day of the year. And purely from the hygienic point of view, we are telling them, nobody will find fault with a person who washes himself five times a day. It's a good hygienic practice. And we all agree, it's a good hygienic practice. We are not washing because we are dirty. We are washing because we are going to meet our Lord. We are going to stand before Allah. Point taken. He says, secondly, it serves certain psychological purposes. Meaning mentally it's preparing the person for prayer. We are going to meet our Allah. Stand before Allah. Thirdly, this is also another commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. In your book, in the book of Exodus, that is the second book of the Bible, it is written. And Moses and Aaron and their sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. So we Muslims are still fulfilling another biblical commandment. Though we haven't got the label of a Jew, nor yet of a Christian, yet in all humility we claim that we are more Jewish than the Jews and more Christian than the Christians. In this, that we are trying to follow in the footsteps of the prophets. No arguments. Wallah, no arguments. The guy is fascinated, man. Then we go into the house of prayer. Please sit at the back. Watch the Muslim at prayer. And you just don't know. When we go into the sujood, the impact that that sujood has on the non-Muslim. Man, the guy has gone down to the ground. With the forehead touching the earth. And there's nothing there. There's nothing there. No monkeys, no elephants, no snakes. Nothing there. And he's gone, fallen down to the ground. That impact that has the sujood has on the non-Muslim, you can't imagine. We take it for granted. You are taking it for granted. Because we're doing it from childhood. That guy said, what is this? What's happening? 
So, if somebody is making salat, we tell the visitor, he says, you know, when the man goes into the sujood, you know, that is how Jesus prayed. So what? My Jesus, praying like that? <laughs> putting his heads down and putting his bumps up? I say, yeah, that's how your Jesus prayed. Your Jesus, your God, that's how he prayed. His heads down and bumps up. You laughing at me? Your God did that. So do we? He has been reading, but he didn't study. Just like us, we, too, we read the Quran, but we don't study. Same, same. The Christian also. He's read the book, but he hasn't studied. Although it's in his language. He says, you remember, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, towards his last days on earth, he went there with his disciples, and he said, wait and watch, look out, keep guard. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed to God. Oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. What did he do? He said, wait and watch. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed to God. And again in the Old Testament it says that Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And again, and Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And again, and Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. And Jesus fell on his face and prayed to God. So how does a man fall on his face and pray? Except the way we Muslims do. Is there another way that you can fall on your face and pray? Can a circus acrobat do anything better than that? No, no, his mind searches. When you say the circus acrobat is thinking, can a circus acrobat, can he? No, he can't. And by the time you finished, there's a tape available. Non-Muslim visitors to your mosque. I should send it and you should be able to... Huh? Brother, video he has one. Oh, this brother who's doing the videotaping, he has the tape. I don't know whether it'll make it possible for you people to see that. Non-Muslim visitors to your mosque, how we handle them. And at the end of it, the guy wants to give you money. You have undermined the religion, his old religion. You have taken the ground from under his feet, but he wants to pay you. What a beautiful way. Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. Invite all to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom. Wal mawizatil hasanat and with beautiful preaching. Wajadilhum billati ahsan and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. This is it. We want to share our experiences with you, my dear brothers. It's an opportunity. You're non-Muslim fellow workers. When you're coming for salah, you say, come, 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 and come and join me. So what, what I have to do is nothing, nothing. Only you'll have to take off your shoes. That's all. You don't have to make ablution. Nothing, nothing. You just come and sit at the back and watch. That watching you at making salat, Wallah, you know, is half the job done. And taking him home for a cup of tea and sharing a few little biscuits and tea with him, 80% of the job is done. Talk man, talk man. Allah has given you endless opportunities. Deliver the message. The Christian is working. He's working very hard. But at the beginning of the century, 1900, Africa was 3% Christian. At the beginning of 1900, 3% of Africa was Christian. Today, 40% of Africa is Christian. 40%. And by the turn of this century, they want to make Africa a Christian continent. And it looks every sign that they will succeed. They are working. There is a law of God that when you sweat for a thing, Allah gives it to you, whether good or bad. Whatever you sweat for, whatever you strive for, Allah gives it to you. They are working. They are working. They don't care for their own people at home, but they are interested in you. They want to save your souls. They are stealing our children. Now, how do we counteract that? The only way is, we in South Africa, we have been more fortunate than you people, that's all. We have been a little more fortunate. Allah has blessed us with little wealth. Our people are business people, whatever little money they make, they give zakat and the charities and they help us and we publish little booklets. The sign of, what was the sign of Jonah? What was the sign of Jonah? You know, a booklet like this, 12 little pages, just 12 little pages, 12 little pages. You master this, there isn't a Christian born who can stand before you. Wallah, there isn't a Christian born who can, with this little thing here. This is like the little stone, like the little stone, resurrection or resuscitation. Who moved the stone? Desert storm, has it ended? Combat kit. Crucifixion of crucifixion, Muhammad the prophet of Islam and so on, some 20 little publications we have been giving out. With these little stones, these are little stones. Something that Hazrat Dawud al-Islam picked up. 
You remember the battle between the Palestinians and the Jews going on for 3,000 years in the Middle East. There's nothing new. At one stage in this battle, the Palestinians had Jalud, Goliath, an eight-foot giant in their midst. And they were very proud. And they were on one hilltop and the Jews were on the opposite hilltop. And Jalud is shouting, eight-foot giant, say you Jews, is there anybody there who will take me on? I'll chew you alive. And the Jews were shivering in their pants. I don't know whether they used to wear pants those days. But <laughs> figuratively they shivered in their pants. Nobody. Nobody. Little Daud is there. Hazrat Daud al Islam. He was no prophet then. He was a shepherd boy looking after his father's sheep and goats. On the opposite hill where the Jews are, he's looking after his father's sheep and goats. And he sees that giant, eight foot giant, you know, swaying because his eight foot is unnatural, unnatural, abnormal, abnormal. You are eight foot, you know, you're not steady on your feet. As if you are drunk. You're not drunk, but you know, there's a size on uneven ground and the guy swaying and sh shouting, Hey, you Jews, I'm going to crush you to death. Come on, come on, is there anybody there? So little Dawood sees, say, that guy there is an easy target. It's easy meat, easy meat for me. So he comes to Saul, Talud, the commander, and he tells the commander, says, Sir, allow me, I'll take him on. He says, What you? You? Go and look after your father's sheep. He says, No, sir, you don't know. You know, that guy there, I can slay him. He says, Look, we veterans of so many wars, we are terrified to face the giant, and you, little nipper? Huh? He says, Sir, you don't understand. You know, I. He's got a secret weapon. Secret weapon. <laughs> so his enthusiasm gets the better of Saul. Talut. Saul the commander. He said, Alright, alright. Here, you want to go and die? Here's my sword and my shield. So little doubt says, Look, sir, I never handled this in my life. Maybe the sword is too heavy for him. Also. He said, I'm going to use my sling. So what? A toy? You know a sling? A, a piece of cloth with two strings attached to it, you put a stone inside and swing, gain the momentum, vwing, 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 and the right moment you let go one side and the stone flies and hits the target. If you are used to practice, practice. This toy, toy, you want to fight a giant with a toy? He says, Sir, you don't understand. Please give me a break. He says, Go. You want to die? You want to commit suicide? Go. So little David walks downhill. And the Palestinians are watching, the little fellow there. Just stand up, my son. Just stand up. Just stand up. Yes. Maybe Dawood was about this size at that time. Sit down. He was about this size, young boy. He's walking downhill. He said, eh? that Jewish boy is coming down. He's coming down. Eh? <laughs> what, 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 what? He's got nothing with him. He's got a piece of string with him in his hand, with a little pouch. And at the stream at the bottom, he picks up a few stones. He says, what is he doing? He's picking up some stones. <laughs> The Palestinians are laughing. <laughs> what, what is this guy? Listen, mad cap, what is he up to? And he's climbing, he's coming nearer. He's coming nearer. <laughs> this guy's mad. He's a lunatic. He comes at the right distance, he puts a stone inside the sling and he swings. Ving, 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 ving. And he's a good marksman. He's been killing birds with it. He's been killing rabbits with it. He's used to. And at the right moment he lets go. And the stone flies and hits Jalut on the forehead, cracks his skull, the guy falls. Little Dawood rushes up, takes his sword and chops off his head. So Allah says, وَقَتَلَ دَعُودُ جَالُوتَ وَأَتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَعَلَّمُهُ مِنْ مَا يَشَاءَ And David killed Goliath. And Allah gave him dominion and power and wisdom and whatever else he would. That little boy. You are those little boys. And these are those little pebbles. You don't need boulders, you don't need scud missiles. These little pebbles will do the job. I don't know if there's anybody or society who's prepared to handle this. I want to send them or print them here. I pay for it. 10,000 copies of this book. Or you say you want 50,000? I have 50,000 copies. I pay for it. If you are prepared to give it to these soldiers of mine, they master this little booklet and man go and crack the Jalut skull. The Christian is the Jalut. He is the Goliath. The mighty America, the mighty Britain, mighty German, mighty French. You little Dawood, each and everyone a little Dawood with a little pebble. This little pebble, I can, you can go and crack his skull. 
may Allah gives you that feeling and the love and feeling for Islam that you do this little work for the glory of Islam and for your glory. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yes, my son. The question is, um, whenever we try to discuss with a Christian person, whenever you try to discuss with a Christian person, that there is no God in this world other than the real one, and he's the only person who controls over the world, he says, and Jesus is not a God, then he says, Jesus is the real God. Then we normally say that, Jesus, they, some of them they normally say that Jesus is a God, and some say Jesus is a son of God. And some of them say we have three gods, but one of them is responsible for all. So now please I would like to know about these gods according to Christian. You see, uh, the question was that when they meet, I mean for the benefit of the people at the back, I don't think they heard your question that the Christians with whom he has chat with, some of them they say that Jesus is God, some of them they say he's the son of God, some of them say that he's one in a trinity which makes him into a God. So how do you respond to the Christian? The easiest way I find is, number one, number one, I ask the Christian, did he claim to be God? A man, whatever he is, you say you're the Prime Minister of Kenya. Somebody says you are the Prime Minister of Kenya. I want to know, did he say that? Did you claim that? No. Don't know he's wasting time. What a Prime Minister ought to do, where he's supposed to be, whether he pulls rickshaws or what. No, no, no. I have no time to waste. Did he claim? He said, no. Finish. He said, that so-and-so is the Prime Minister. My Imam is the Prime Minister of Kenya. He said, did your Imam say that? He says, no, I says, finish. Don't waste time. Jesus, did he say he's God? Is there a single place in the Christian Bible? Single place in the Christian Bible where Jesus says, I'm God, or where he says, worship me. I'm telling the people, my audiences, where the Christians are, say, I am prepared to accept him as God, and I am prepared to worship him. If Jesus, in any Bible, any Bible, any version, of the Bible, they have dozens, dozens of versions. In any Bible, if he can show me that Jesus says, I'm God, I said, I accept him. If he says, worship me, I'm prepared to worship him. Show me. So you mean to say, it's not there? I said, you show me. Did the man say that? No. Instead, he says, my father is greater than I. My father is greater than all. These are his words. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's his greatness. He, and he fell on his face and prayed to God, O oh my father. Who is he praying to himself? Is he his own father? <laughs> huh? O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. But not me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. Whose will? Allah's will. So who is God? Who is he crying to? On the cross he's supposed to have cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, in, in Hebrew, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is he crying to himself? Huh? He let himself down? Huh? No, you can make a monkey out of the guy. You see, if you know a little bit about his book, you got to know his book. What did Jesus say? Did he say I'm God? Did he say worship me? Three in one. Did Jesus say that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, but there are not three gods but one God? Did he say any such thing? No. In your book. Did Jesus say that? That the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, but there are not three gods but one God? Did he say that? He says no. What did he say? He says come, come. I'll teach you how to pray. Say, pray like this. O oh, our Father, which art in heaven, yours and mine, including Judas the traitor. He is the father of everybody. The sinner and the saint. He is the father, cherisher, lord, sustainer of everybody. O oh, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where did he say the father of Jesus Christ in heaven? So you have to do a little bit of homework to find out what the guy, his book, Allah is telling you. Whenever he makes any claim, 
Verse Waqalu and they say Lan yadkhul al-jannata illa man kana hudan or nasara That you Muslims will never never enter Jannah There is no heaven for you There is no salvation for you Unless you become a Jew or unless you become a Christian In answer to that Allah says Tilka amaniyuhum That this is their wishful thinking Vain desires, hallucination, bakwas, babbling, babbling, they're babbling Don't get frightened Qul Tell them Hatu burhan Produce your proof Burhan, your proof in Kundum Sadiqin. If you are speaking the truth, let us have a look at your proof. So he's produced it, the Bible. So right now, what it means is that you must analyze it. And you analyze it by reading these booklets of mine. How to analyze this? What the guy says, how to analyze it? And you can see he hasn't got a leg to stand upon. We are tops, wallah, we are tops, man. There isn't a, a group of people. Allah says, Liyuzi hira hu ala deena kulli. He's given you a deen, a way of life. There is a master, overcome and supersede them all. Bulldoze them all. Whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, Judaism. Every ism, Islam is destined to master them all. Bulldoze them all. Have you seen a bulldozer at work? Bulldozer. Have you seen it at work? Bulldozer. You know bulldozer? The thing that levels up the ground, man, and remove mountains. Bulldozer. You know, bulldozer. Yeah, you are that. We Muslims are bulldozers. For battle. Bulldoze them all. Whatever it is. That's our destiny. That's our destiny Allah has stored for us. But we have chosen the role of becoming a punching bag for people. They're using us as a punching bag. They're using us as a doormat. That's not the role Allah has in store for you. It's your choice. You want to be a doormat? Be a doormat. Yes, my son. Was Jesus crucified? Uh, the question is, was Jesus crucified? No, Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ They didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ But it was made to appear to them so. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَقٍ مِّنْهُمْ And those who dispute therein are full of doubts. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمْ They have no certain knowledge. إِلَّا تِبَى زَنْ They only follow conjecture, guesswork, fiction. وَمَا قَتَلُهُ يَقِينًا For a surety, they killed him not. You ask that question, here's the book, Crucifixion or Crucifixion, that's yours. Yes. Verses 45, Angel is said, telling to Mary, O Mary, what is given you, glad chiding of a word from him, his name will be the Christ to Jesus. And in verses 47 of the same Surah al Imran, the Mary is telling, O my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? It is the verses about the miraculous birth. Now my question to you, do you know anybody in the earth who has born or come in this art miraculously if you know how do you treat them how do you treat them yes you see you tell the Christian we accept Jesus Christ he was born miraculously without any male intervention sorry, sorry my question do you know anybody else I'm, that's what I'm telling you too, you too impatient number one you came all the way from the back you broke everybody's right to ask questions See, you came all the way from the back and you get, without any permission, you got stuck into the question. Right, but now you have to take your turn. But however, what you quoted is Haq. Jesus Christ in the house of Islam was born miraculously, without any male intervention. Now, the Christian on that assumption that because he had no father, his father is God. He is the begotten son of God. That is assuming from that, that because he got no father, everybody must have a father. Who's his father? Joseph the carpenter. We say, no, we don't know this guy, Joseph the carpenter. Who's his father? So his father is God. So Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, Inna masala Isa, inda Allahi kamasali Adama. The similitude or the example of Jesus in the sight of Allah is that of Adam. خَلَقَهُ مِنْ تُرَابٍ Allah created him from dust. Adam, from dust. ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ And said, be, and he was. So if Jesus, because he's got no father, if he is God, and the begotten son of God, then Adam has a greater right to be a God and the son of God. But the Christian, he tries to be too clever, tries to be funny. He said, but you see, Adam was made from dust. I said, right, right. 
Then I said, you see in your book, the Bible, there is another person, Melchizedek. In your Bible, there is a person called Melchizedek, the high priest of Salem. Without father, without mother, without beginning, without end. Who can that be? Only God has these qualities. Without father, without mother, without beginning, without end. Jesus had a beginning in the stable. Ask him, is it true? He was born in the stable. So yes, so he had a beginning in the stable. And he had an apparent end on the cross. You say he died on the cross. So he had an apparent end on the cross. He had a beginning and he had an apparent end. Right? This man, Melchizedek, the high priest of Salem, no father, no mother, no beginning, no end. He's greater than Jesus Christ. Why don't you worship him? He's in your Bible. He's, he's in your Bible. Your Bible. Every Bible. Yeah. Take this book and look for the subject Melchizedek, Melchizedek, and you'll find the references. Book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 1. God never dies. If he thinks Jesus is God, God never dies. Now, what, now what's happening to you now? <laughs> what spirit is moving you, my brothers? No, no, no. Right. Right, you. Uh, my question is, uh, Alhamdulillah, because of the efforts of the, like, the likes of you, people who have uh, uh, sent uh, Christians and Jews looking for cover, we are able today, especially the youth, we are able to out-argue the Christians wherever they come. And Alhamdulillah, they have really uh, minimized their knocking on our doors now. Because most of the time, they are not sure of themselves wherever they come. But now, a problem that we are facing today is the Muslims themselves, uh, they are not very sure of their own faith. And you will, you will find that someone who does not know anything about Islam is able to argue with a Christian and send him uh, looking for cover. Now, don't you think that it's time we shifted our attention from the Christian to the Muslims themselves so that we may have uh, properly molded Muslims who, even when, when they out argue the Christian, they would go to show him the way. Instead of the Christian letter, even if he is out argued and uh, he does not have what to say, are very few people who are showing them the, the right character. So don't you think it's time we shifted our attention to the Muslims and said? Uh, you see, uh, our brother's question is that we talk to the Christians, but we ourselves are not good examples. You know, we must devote our attention to the Muslims. Is that it? Yes. I said, you see, my brother, we have among the Muslims a lot of people who work among Muslims. I don't know how many masjids you have in Kenya. How many? How many? 500? 1000? Huh? In South Africa, we have 400 masjids. And in my country, every masjid has an imam. And every masjid has a muazzin. So I'm asking these imams, who are they talking to, if not to you? And the muazzin, who is he calling, if not you? In my country, there are 400 Imams and 400 Muslims. They are calling the Muslims. Is there somebody else who is calling the Christian? They say, Ahmad did that. I said, I do. Look, Ahmad did that. One swallow doesn't make a summer. Right? So the thing is, is, now there are people, there's a Tablighi Jamaat. I don't know whether you have one here. Who are they working among? You! To make you a better Muslim. To teach you how to make Salat. How to read the Kalima, the Shahada. They are doing the job. Everybody is doing his job. Right? I am a specialist, so now I'm arming you in this. That this is the battle, in this battle, I said these are the pebbles you need, and this is how you throw the pebble and not crack his skull. Right. In the meantime, you are also getting benefit as a Muslim. You're listening to me as a Muslim. It's enthusing your iman, increasing your iman, making you to feel that no man, we can give battle to the Nasara. <coughs> it's doing you a good turn, and at the same time arming you. But in the meantime, there are Muslims who are doing a job. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Yes, my son. It's my pleasure, Mr. Bidat. That's your discussion. You've shown us so many things here in Sandwich and how to combat it. But you have not, in one of your books, which I've been going through for several times, not mentioned how to combat nothing. 
<laughs> the Munafik. <laughs> Shall I tell you? Allah Bari Ta'ala says in the Quran, the answer to your problem. So, inna al munafikina fi darkil asfali min al-nar. That the Munafik will in the deepest depth of Jahannam, hellfire. And there are Munafiks everywhere, among all people. You see, somebody might point a finger at you. And he says, look, you don't make salat. You are a Munafik. Shh. Now you're going to argue and debate with him? No. Everybody pointing a finger at that and says, you are a Munafik. You are a Munafik. You, you don't do what you say. You don't do what you say. You are a Munafik. So look, this is a common trait. The thing is, man, become a good Muslim to the best of your ability. Right? And what little knowledge you have, this is what I'm giving you. If it's useful to you, use it. If it can be of any use to you, say you read all my books, then you should be giving battle to the Christians. That that Tulunga, that, that, uh, what is that uh, uh, Cardinal Tulunga, what's that? What's his name? Otunga. Otunga. You should have challenged him to a debate. You, 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 you are fit for that. Wallah, the question you asked gives me the idea that you are fit. You read all my books. And you want to know what about the Munafiks? That's right. This Otunga fellow, he said he wants to put things on a war footing against Islam, against the Muslims in Kenya. And you are the fittest guy to debate him. Have you challenged him yet? I so, you have? I have a challenge. It was <laughs> Did you write to him and register a letter? <laughs> no good. Why didn't you write to him direct? He said, I challenge you in the Kenyatta Center. Come and debate with me, you Cardinal Udunga. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you see my brother, you are a Munafik. <laughs> no, with apologies, please forgive me, I'm just, I'm just talking. <laughs> Rest my son. Look, it looks like it's going to carry on till midnight. Two more, two more, two more. Yeah. The last two questions, this one and another two more, that's all. Okay, please be satisfied. There is a limit. This old machine, <laughs> look, his old machine. <laughs> sad. Have, have mercy on me, please. This one and two more. Okay. Yes, my son. Let us ask you, Mr. Higgins. Yes. We Muslims, we are proud. We, our prophet is the last prophet. Sure. Some people used to say that the Christian uh, Jesus was come by him. Some people say he will not come by him. Some the uh, uh, Amadiya people they uh, did not mean that Jesus will not come by him. If he come by him, that means uh, to say prophet is last. Is not true. So I want you to. Yes. Uh, the brother is asking, he said, we believe that our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Khatam al-Nabiyin. He is the last of the prophets, he is the seal of the prophets. He said, yes. Now the Qadianis, this is they are saying that if Jesus Christ is coming back in his second coming, then our Nabi is not the last prophet. Is that the question? So what is the answer? You see, the one who's got the title, Khatam al nabiyin that title you can't take away. This is a new prophet, another new prophet coming along. The one that went, went out and came back again. I'm going to give a prize to the guy, the hundredth guy that comes in. He gets a prize, a reward from me. One thousand shillings. Right? So that guy comes in. He gets his thousand shillings. And then he goes out. He goes out. And the guy wants to come back again. It's not counted. He's going to come back again. You don't count that. The one he came in when he was the hundredth guy, he got his ticket and he's got his prize. Our Nabi, the last of the prophets, he got his title. Khatam al-Nabi. The Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah. Right? We don't need any more. We don't need a prophet. And we don't need a, a, you know, another book. Right? Khatam al-Nabi. That guy, because he wants to make his man, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, as Jesus Christ in his second coming, therefore now all this exercise. He wants to make the Mirza Ghulam Ahmad his leader to become, to take the place of Jesus Christ in his second coming. He said that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was Jesus Christ in his second coming. Therefore he wants to kill Jesus and he wants to do all these arguments. He's wasting Tell him, man, look, what is your purpose? If you want to propagate Islam, look, the Christians, there are millions around you here. Right? But he's not interested in the Christians, he's interested in you. He's interested in you. That means he's creating division. If you are interested in doing dawah, go and give dawah to the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus. Man, there are millions in the world today. Right? What do you want to pick up with me? 
Huh? I'm a Muslim, I believe in Allah and His Holy Prophet and the Holy Quran. You are wasting your time with me. Right. One, yes, you, my brother. Yes, yesterday at uh, Muslim Nur, you, you touched about uh, paradise. Was it in Had or in heaven? You didn't ask that. What is the, uh, uh, the paradise? Is it in the Had or in Yeah, you see, you, you people, you missed the bus yesterday I said look at the time when I was questioned in Sudan I didn't have the answer in other words now I got the answer but nobody asked me <laughs> so what is the answer Mr. Didat at the class I had this morning one of them asked what is the answer so I had to give the answer you ask me the question then I give the answer what does the Quran say what does the Quran say so I said this answer is in Surah Ali Imran that is chapter 3, ayah number 133, Allah says, ila min rabbikum. Means Make a race, race man, run for Allah's maghfirah, for his forgiveness and his jannah. Allah is telling you, ila min rabbikum wa jannatin. And a Jannah whose width, the width, width wide. How wide is Jannah? Allah is saying in the Quran. Is the width of the heavens and the earth put together. <laughs> the width of your Jannah. How is this, how long it is? How what is this depth? Shh, Allah is not talking about. Only the width of it is the width of the heavens and the earth put together. There is no place for hell. So big is Jannah. That is what Allah says. That means you can't say it's here, uh, in Kenya, your Jannah will be established, or in Ceylon, you know, in the Garden Paradise. No, 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 no. The Jannah will be as extensiveness as the extensiveness of the heavens and the earth put together. Our Nabi said that. He says, how big is Jannah? He says, it is as extensive as the extensiveness of the heavens and the earth put together. So they asked him, how big is hell? Jahannam. He says, Jahannam is as extensive as the extensiveness of the heavens and the earth put together. So if they are so big, both of them, how can they exist? So our Nabi said, where is the night when the day comes? Where is the night when the day comes? Means it's the same place. Same place, night and day. Same place, that night is there, the day is the same place. Which means it's a condition in which you find yourself. It is not a locality. You know, with a boundary. Your Jannat. You know, 50 kilometers, a thousand kilometers, square kilometers. No, no, no. Your Jannah will be as vast and your hell will be as vast. Everybody will be accommodated. <laughs> That was the last. One more. <laughs> please, please. As a student at my school, usually I do these Christians. Other Christians. A little louder, my son. I can't hear. Come, come close. Right, I will, I will really relay your question. As a student at our school, Jampi High School, we shall argue with our Christians and uh, sort of reason with them. Now when we reason with them, when we corner them, they'll become arrogant and abusive. How can we deal with such characters? Thank you. Uh, he's at the school and when he argues and reasons with the Christian, when they lose, they lose their tempers and they become argumentative and abusive. So how do you handle that? Allah tells us in the Holy Quran, When you meet the ignorant one who addresses you with arrogance, what do you say? You say, peace, you go your way, I go my way. <laughs> but until that, you try. Reason, logic. You shake him up, you made a crack, you made a crack in his faith. Although when he loses his temper, we know he lost. So you persevere. You show softness and say, brother, akhi, brother, like this, like that, and push it in some more, and push it in some more, right? But humble yourself, humble. Don't have fist cuffs. Don't say, right, come on, we'll fight it out. No. Humble yourself. But the worst is this, salams, peace. You go your way, I go my way. Please, please. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Rabbil Alameen.
On behalf of Jamma Mosque Committee Majlis and Imam, I wish to extend our very, very sincere thanks to Sheikh Ahmed Didat. Tomorrow and day after, inshallah, Sheikh Ahmed Didat is in Mombasa, and to know where his lectures will take place, you may find out from Mehman Villa in Mombasa. On Thursday, inshallah, Sheikh Ahmed Didat's lecture will be conducted at Sir Ali Muslim Club at 7 p.m. Sir Ali Muslim Club at 7 p.m. And also here on Friday, the pre khutbah lecture will be del delivered by Sheikh Ahmed Didat. We are indeed very fortunate and grateful to the entourage, and we wish them luck. Shukran. Thank <clears throat> you.